Thank you so much. It is so exciting to be here with David Schwartz, the Chief Technology Officer of Ripple and one of the original architects of the XRP Ledger. I think it would help both of us if we get a sense for how familiar the audience is with Ripple and XRP. Can I see a show of hands of who is familiar with Ripple and XRP? Oh, great. Okay, so I think it's worth starting with a little bit of your background. How did you go from programming calculators to cryptography at the NSA to crypto assets and then to Ripple? Um, I guess I discovered Bitcoin in 2011. I had been working on um, cryptography for secure messaging, cloud storage for customers like the NSA and you know, various governments and military organizations. And when I first saw Bitcoin, it was one of those things where I, I, you could almost call it love at first sight. Like I saw the technology and I thought, wow, you know, there's really, there's really something here. And I wanted to learn everything I possibly could about it. And I, I found out, I found the communities and I looked at the source code. And I, I happened to be a little bit lucky that there was a problem at the time. This was just around the rise of mining pools and the software was never designed to handle mining pools. So there were a lot of people who were complaining about performance issues in the software. And one of the things that I'd specialized in was improving the performance of software. And I saw these bounties, mining pools were like, I'll pay 10 Bitcoins if someone can fix this problem. I'll kick in 15 Bitcoins if someone can solve this problem. And they were worth about $15 a piece, so that was real money. And it's kind of hard to understand a complicated piece of code just randomly exploring it, like having some sort of an objective, something that guides you, because kind of, otherwise it's sometimes hard to know what's the next step. Like, what, do you just look at some random chunk of code? You know, what do you explore? So I explored from the direction of solving that problem that mining pools had, and I solved the problem, and they paid the bounties. And it's kind of funny, uh, when I went to buy a house in Oakland, I used the bounties as the deposit, and it was the first time Wells Fargo ever had to do the provenance of funds. So they actually went to the old posts on the Bitcoin forum where, I, where people had offered the bounties and I'd claimed it. Um, and I kind, of, I kind of fell in love with Bitcoin because of the lack of the need for a sort of central operator or a central point of trust. Um, it was already becoming apparent that like centralization, particularly in like, we saw the, the revolution of the internet sort of decentralizing the control of information where anybody who had an idea could tell anybody who wanted to hear it about that idea. We've backslid on that in the past couple of years and new centralized arbiters of information flow have kind of emerged, but at the time, you know, it was tremendously empowering, and the idea that you could do something similar with the flows of funds, you know, if you think about the way countries like North Korea use the control over the flow of information, or used to, I think people in North Korea thought that Kim Jong-il was like a respected intellectual in the West when the truth was completely the opposite. But if you're the only person who can talk to your people, you have tremendous control over, over what they think. If you tell them that the United States is filled with poor people living in the streets and we have it better here, and they'll believe it because they don't have those other sources of information. And the internet was a, a very powerful force for good in democratizing the flow of information. And today, flow of control, the flow of funds is used in that same way. If you can, if you look at Venezuela, like if you can cause the currency to become worthless, that, that allows you a significant amount of control over people's lives. And the ability of the technology to, to change that is what really excited me. And it, it's been, you know, six years since then, seven years since then, and we have not delivered on that promise yet, but I'm still very optimistic that the technology will deliver on that kind of promise. And what were you looking to do when you went to Ripple, when you were part of the birth of Ripple? So uh, when we looked at Bitcoin, uh, I think a lot of people in the community thought that the proof of work was like the secret sauce or the magic element in Bitcoin. And what, what I and a few other people, Jed McCaleb realized this first, is that, um, and, and that, that was a key insight of his that led to the formation of, of the XRP Ledger, and ultimately Ripple, was his insight that proof of work was not the secret sauce. The secret sauce of Bitcoin is that all of the state information is public. The ledger is completely public. You can see every transaction, every balance, everything is public. And what that means is that you don't have to take anybody else's word for anything. Like if someone submits a transaction, you can check if it's valid. You can figure out what it does all by yourself. And that that was the sort of decentralization magic. And that proof of work was just the way that it, it solved the double spend problem, the idea that you know, if I have a, one Bitcoin, what if I try to send it to two different people? How do we figure out which one? And that, that kind of led to this idea that there might be other ways to solve the double spend problem that might have different characteristics from Bitcoin. They might be cheaper, they might be faster, they might be worse, but you know, they might be better for some use cases. Um, and this idea that, that we should try to explore, 
I guess an analogy I sometimes use is if you discovered an alien artifact and it did something amazing, like the first thing that you would try to figure out is how does it do that amazing thing? Is it, does it have like some, something, you guys have probably seen Black Panther, right? Like they have a metal that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world and that's how they do all this magic stuff. So does it have some secret thing that nobody else has? Or is it an incredibly clever arrangement of parts that we understand and sort of take it apart and then think, well, how else can we put those parts together? What else can we use that secret sauce for to solve other problems? And I think that effort has blossomed to now we have, you know, something like 1,000 blockchains and 1,500 assets, and sure, a lot of them are garbage. But I mean, that, to be fair, like, but, some, but the, good, the good ones are hopefully going to get discovered in that pile, and we'll, you know, we'll figure out what the use cases are. But it's that idea that it's not, it's not one solution. Like, we don't all drive Model Ts, right? Like, the Model T gave people the inspiration that we could have, you know, something better than a horse, but we don't drive Model Ts, right? Like, we have trucks, and we have sports cars, and all these different types of uh, optimizations of the very same arrangement of parts, but for different use cases. And how do you see the XRP ledger being used beyond payments? Well, so today the primary use case, at least that Ripple's interested in, is international payments, settling cross-currency payments, uh, because it's really, really good at that. Um, but there are definitely other companies that are looking at using the same technology for other applications, and it's very hard to know what the right use cases are. Uh, I sometimes joke about, like, if we were talking about email in the early 90s, we might have said, well, maybe if it's wildly successful, it'll, get, it'll capture the 40% of postal mail that isn't like a package and isn't super personal like a wedding invitation. But obviously, if you look at your emails, 98% of them would never have been postal mails under any circumstances. They're completely new and different things. So it, it's very hard to say. Um, I'm excited about some of these interesting financial use cases that are starting, the, 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 at least for the short term, the, the focus seems to be on financial use cases because that's where this idea of centralized control is such a problem. Um, there's applications, things like lending, um, things like stable coins, tokens that, are non that, aren't, that aren't as volatile. It, it, there's a huge explosion of innovation around not just the XRP ledger, but the entire space. And, and the biggest challenge, I think, is finding the use cases that fit the technology. And I'll be honest, we, we haven't done a good job at that yet. You know, people will ask you, I'll explain an idea to someone, I'll say, well, what's it good for? What's the use case? And I have to cheat and say, well, any time you need, and then I list its characteristics. But that's cheating, right? That's not a use case. So the use case is the actual case where you need those things. So use case fit, we have that in payments. I mean, make no mistake, these things work for particularly international or cross-currency payments because domestic payments in most of the world work pretty well. Although there are exceptions. I'm sure most of you have heard of PayPal and Venmo. They're owned by the same company. They don't interoperate. Like that's a domestic payment that clearly that's like an example of domestic payments that don't work. But I think domestic payments, the, the cases where they don't work are the exception. International payments are where we really have product market fit right now. And what do you think the relation is between the price of XRP and the success of Ripple? Well, there doesn't seem to be any, which is kind of a strange thing. It's very hard to understand the way prices behave. I think what's happening right now is at least the market doesn't seem to distinguish very much between the attributes of particular projects. It seems like they're sort of betting on the space as a whole. Like if you look at the price of Ethereum and Bitcoin and XRP and Stellar Lumens and Litecoin, they correlate incredibly well with each other. If people saw them as competitive, if people said like Bitcoin and Litecoin and XRP are competing for the same use case, you would think that good news for Bitcoin would be bad news for XRP or Litecoin and the market doesn't seem to think so. So I think the bet right now is kind of either cryptocurrencies are going to take over the world or they won't. And if they take over the world, they might all be winners or they might be winners and losers, but we don't really know who those will be yet. And so we're sort of betting on the space as a whole. And I guess the same thing could have happened in search in the early days, like Google was in search, but so was Lycos and Excite and AltaVista and AskGs. And if you thought, I really think search is going to be the next big thing, okay, well, could you have picked Google? Probably not. Like you might, have, you might have sort of spread your bets around the space or sort of hoped that they would all win. Or even if you thought there would only be one winner, you wouldn't think that you could predict it. But it's also possible that prices are completely irrational and manipulated. Um, I don't know. And it's kind of frustrating that I think anyone who tells you they know is lying. It, it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's great when like amateurs will tell you, hey, I understand exactly what's going on. Here's my thesis. And the experts will tell you we have no idea what's going on. But there are a lot of spaces where if I knew, I'd be rich, right? Like, I would just be able to bet on the winners and, or, or predict the way the news is going to affect the price. I'm constantly surprised by market behavior, so I don't pretend to know. But do you think in the long term that the intrinsic value of XRP should be tied to the success of Ripple, or can they be completely independent? I would expect it to tie to the success of the ecosystem, which would include projects like Ripple and Forte and Coil, 
but but I do, but I don't I don't know how rational that expectation is or whether the price follows rational expectations. It's it's quite difficult to tell. Again, at least for the last year or so, the performance of every major cryptocurrency doesn't seem to relate. Uh, an interesting point is um, like the only events that have been proven to be correlated with the price of cryptocurrencies is exchanges. So like there used to be the Coinbase effect, like when Coinbase would list a cryptocurrency, you would see a huge spike in its price. And then you would see team news, whether it comes from things that Ripple are doing or things that Consensus is doing or other major projects, and there's no movement in the price. So. Either people think exchanges are like the gatekeepers of success of the ecosystem, or the prices are irrational. Um, I, I, honest, I, don't, I don't know. It's, it's ba I wish I did. Like, it's something that we look at and try to understand, and we basically keep throwing our hands up. It's, kind of, it's actually pretty frustrating to not understand um, you know, a marketplace that's, that, that we're not, de we're not you know, these projects are not dependent on the prices of their tokens. It's not like you know, Ethereum fails if the price of Ether goes down, or XRP is a failure, or success if the price goes up or down. Th that isn't really about like, does it produce a product that meets a use case. But it definitely feels like a success metric to people in the space, and it kind of feels demoralizing when the price goes down, and it feels good when the price goes up. So <laughs> I wish we did understand it. What are some of your pet peeves about blockchain and crypto? What are the things people most misunderstand? Well, boy, there are a lot. Um, so one is, that, one is that the prices are a metric of the success of the projects. Um, they're a metric of something, but I don't know what. Like, the success of the projects, from my mind, is like, are we developing new and interesting technologies? Do we have product market fit, use case fit? We're succeeding on some of those metrics, and we're failing on others. But at least, like, judge us on the right metrics. Judge us on whether we're producing products that meet people's needs. Judge us on, you know, whether we, we have a use case that, that, that the technology fits. Um, I think another one is this idea that blockchains are very expensive or that they're not competitive with conventional databases for other applications. That's true today, but like the Model T wasn't competitive with horses, right? Like you have to look at what's fundamental to the technology. Um, scalability is the one thing that I have to give us a low mark on. We have lots of different interesting scaling technologies, but I wish I could point to one and say, don't worry about scalability, we'll fix it. But um, security, reliability, no major blockchain has had downtime in the past couple of years. What centralized service can do that? And cost, people say, well, blockchains are so expensive. Well, proof of work is expensive. Centralized databases are expensive. Um, I was talking to some pharmaceutical companies who are looking for a database application that involves tracking the movement of their goods. And they were quoted many millions of dollars by companies that like their job is to provide centralized databases. Well, you can stand up a private Ethereum node if you want, you know, a couple of them. Um, it's much cheaper and the reliability is higher. And I think also the security difference, that so people will say, well, there are applications that aren't super, super uh, security isn't super critical. But what, what I think they miss is the fact that certain types of attacks are fundamentally impossible on blockchains. Any attack that involves just injecting fake data is just absolutely impossible in a database. And when, uh, in, a, in a blockchain where it's possible in a database, and you say, well, that really isn't a problem. Well, it really isn't a problem in a database because you've built the whole design around the fact that you have to make that not a problem. You have to decide, like, well, if I have two databases, how do I keep them in sync? And which one's active? And what do I do well, if there's bad data in there? And how do I authenticate it? Like, Lots of the cost and the operational expense, the operational expense, once you've built the system, the operational expense has a lot to do with what you have to secure and what you have to monitor. These centralized systems have very complex failure modes. You might have redundant databases. Okay, well, what if each database thinks the other one failed? Now they're both active. Like, you have these incredibly complex failure modes to untangle. Blockchain is tremendously exciting as a general technology, as a way of representing data and executing transactions that could potentially be very competitive Maybe not with proof of work, maybe with some of the scaling improvements, but it could be very competitive with centralized systems that bluntly are oversold as being cheap and reliable. They're, they're, they're not. They're not incredibly expensive, they're not unreliable, but they're not dirt cheap and completely reliable. And blockchain has the potential to be cheaper and more reliable. And can you talk more about the scalability problem? What solutions does that make blockchain not a possibility for? Well, it comes down to whether you have to replicate all the data to every single node. Most blockchains today, they replicate every piece of data to every node, and that sets a sort of baseline cost and expense. Whereas other systems, like if you look at how Visa processes transaction, they're sort of horizontally scalable. So you have this transaction processor over here, and you have a transaction processor over here, and if this, this one's too busy, they, like, they share the load. Um, and if two are not enough, you add three or four or five or six. And then you wind up with like back end pieces that you have to scale, but your sort of front end that's doing most of the work and validating and checking things, it scales nicely. 
We don't know how to do that for blockchain yet. We have these sort of side chain type projects. So if you're trying to, if, if you're in an application where processing tens of thousands of transactions per second is critical to the use case, Visa would be a good example. Using a blockchain directly is not a good mix. On the other hand, if you have an application where the transaction set is more constrained, like going back to pharmaceutical companies, like tracking vaccines to make sure that like there aren't two vaccines with the same serial number or like a vaccine is, but when you buy it, you know that your supplier got it from an authorized supplier and didn't find it on a loading dock or something. Like those are not as critically dependent on scaling. And like I said, there are a lot of solutions on the horizon for scaling, but they're all sort of aimed at some at specific subsets of the problem or suitable for only some use cases. What they basically do generally is they sort of aggregate transactions off the chain and then sort of settle on the chain. And if you have an application where that fits nicely, um, finance is probably a good one. Like if you're, uh, a good example would be Coil. Coil did a billion payments last year with an average dollar amount of like a 10,000th of a penny. Obviously, you're, you know, you're, those are not all gonna be on a blockchain. Like that doesn't make any sense. But what you can use the blockchain as sort of the arbiter in case there's a dispute or failure, and then you can make these very fast, very cheap payments one layer away. But, but it's, it's gonna come down to what new technologies we can develop to improve the scalability to be able to extend to use cases that require more scaling. And it seems there's been a conversation about what really makes something more decentralized than something else. How do you define, what's the most important thing in, in something a database being decentralized? I, I think it comes down to what determines the rules of the system. Um, like if you think about a centralized system, like let's say PayPal, PayPal determines the rules of the system. And if you don't like the rules that PayPal has, you can sort of go, you theoretically can go elsewhere, but you can't, you can't make PayPal be this other thing that you want it to be because PayPal has the data, PayPal owns the relationships with like the other financial institutions. Um, like a traditional centralized service, the users have to, ex like somebody decides what the users get and then they decide whether they like that or not. And their freedom is to leave, is, is to take it or leave it, which is, you know, it's, it's not inherently coercive, but it's, it's not what decentralized systems have. What decentralized systems have is they don't have any party who can coerce other parties to, to accept the rules. So what happens is if 99% of the people in the system want a particular rule change, they can just make that rule change. They don't need anyone's permission, they don't need to coerce anyone, and then like the 1% who may or may not like it, they can either go along or they can sort of leave. But another important thing is your freedom to leave is much more fundamental. Like you theoretically have the freedom to leave a bank or to leave a payment system, but you can't take the data with you. If you want to leave Bitcoin and take the data with you so that other people who join can sort of pick up right where they left off with the existing system, for the old system to the new system, you can have that smooth transition, you can do that. And if you take 80% of the value with you, as happened with Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, so a group of people didn't agree with the, the, the majority of the Bitcoin ecosystem on the block size, and so they split off. And then those two systems sort of fought for user base, but they didn't fight for user base the way like PayPal and Venmo did before they were owned by the same company. They fought for user base because users could, could, could automatically transact on either system. So what they fought for was the value behind the system. The value was free to go with those people who, who uh, created it. And so I think that's that thing, that idea that there is no coercive element that can force the users to accept system rules that they don't like. So they literally vote with the code they run. You mentioned earlier that we've moved further and further away from centralization in some places, but in other places, like with social media and art and the internet, the there are places where things have become more centralized. Is there a blockchain solution to some of those issues that we're seeing? Maybe. Um, I think my fear specifically, when it, particularly when it comes to social media, is that people want systems that are fairly centralized. I, it's like privacy. People, everyone will tell you they want privacy, but they'll go to these centralized systems that, that where they're the product, and they won't pay you know, $5 a month because they say they want privacy. And, and they may not, it may be uh, that social media companies, like Twitter is a good example, like a lot of people say, well, why can't Twitter allow any speech that's allowed under the First Amendment of the United States? Well, because most of the people on Twitter like want less Nazi speech, they just do. And, and they're Twitter's customers, and so Twitter has to provide what their customers want. And we might say, oh yeah, I, I would like to live in a world where people wanted a social media system where anyone could say anything, but we don't live in that, you know, we don't live in that world and we don't have, you know, and so it, in the social media space, I think we kind of, we kind of, to some extent, deserve what we got. Um, like, I really do think these companies are providing the products their customers want, and so like the fault lies with us. 
people are building blockchain systems that, are, that have these more relaxed rules, and I think by and large that's not what, what people want. And I think that's another use case fit that things like Bitcoin have. Like if you look at Bitcoin, you're like, well, I control my own keys and, and, and you know, I make a payment and it's irreversible and so I don't have to worry about like, someone disputing a payment, but people want more safety, like they really do. Like if you talk to you know, the stereotypical grandmother type, you know, or, or, you know, or person who just does, they don't want to have to deal with, oh, I lost my keys, or they want to be able to call someone up. You can't call up Bitcoin. Um, that is a real sort of mismatch between what we're building today. Now, the internet was that way in the early days, too. I, I might be dating myself here, but when I first used the internet, my internet service provider sent me a letter that contained a piece of paper that explained the DOS batch files I had to edit for my TCP IP settings. Now, then there were no graphical tools. Like, so we're in that early stage where we're not really ready for that kind of mass adoption. And we also really have to think about what do our target customers actually want? Not what should they want, you know, as, as many people do. Um, what do they really want? What is it that they actually want? And it's often not what we think they should want. And so if you're sort of producing the thing that you think people should want, which is what a lot of people in this space are doing, you can produce some very interesting technology, but you won't have that product market fit. And we're kind of in the midst of this crypto winter, and I want to ask the audience again, how many people were holding crypto assets last year, a year ago from now? And how many people are holding crypto assets now? So pretty similar. About the same number? Yeah. Yeah, so I was wondering, like, would that number go up because more people find out, or would it go down because people kind of got out? Um, it seems like, it seems like, at least it seems like it's largely the same people who just kind of sat through the crypto winter. Yeah. It, it is, it, it kind of feels a little depressing on sort of an emotional state because it's hard not to think of the price as like an assessment of the worth of the projects. I, but the technical work that's going on, um, Ripple has, has uh, an effort called Spring, which we meet with other projects and we talk about what they're doing and we try to help them find product market fit. Sometimes that might be an investment, sometimes it might just be advice, sometimes it might be some sort of a joint venture, whatever that, that looks to be. And I'm tremendously excited by the number of projects that we see that are building interesting technology. And yes, a lot of them are baffled by the product market fit. I can't tell you how many times I'm like, that is a great technology. Wow, I'm super excited that you guys are working on that. What is the use case you're imagining? And you know, they come back with, well, we sort of have this use case that we kind of think I see someone ask, like, asked a question about avocado farms. It's like a good example. Like, you kind of could see the use case, but we're probably going to be wrong about the use cases, and that's okay. Uh, um, the internet was great. Email was great. There were lots of technologies that the Model T like, led to a technology that was great, but if, if in the early days of those technologies we tried to predict what people would use it for and how, we'd probably have been completely wrong. Um, micropayments are another thing that, that, that I've done a lot of work on and that Ripple's done a lot of work on through the Interledger project. And it's like, well, what are they good for? And we give dumb answers like, oh, like you could pay to go through a revolving door. Like, who wants to pay to go through a revolving door? But I mean, like, okay, you could pay for Wi-Fi everywhere you go. Okay, that's nice, but you know, my cell phone service works pretty well. It's like, but you've got to think that, you know, if, if, we, if, if, if you look at a chart of internet bandwidth usage over the past 20 years, it's this huge exponential growth. But back here, it didn't feel like we were bandwidth constrained. Like, nobody could have thought of Netflix or YouTube because we didn't have the bandwidth. And so you're like, we got enough bandwidth for the things we want to do. No, we have enough bandwidth for the things we can do. We don't know the things we'd want to do if we have more bandwidth. So, I mean, it's... I, I, I kind of feel like a cheerleader, but, I, but one of the things that I want to see in this space is I want to see smart people like going into this space and working on interesting projects. If you look, there was a time when the cool people worked at Apple, and then there was a time when like the cool people kind of worked at Facebook, and then they kind of moved to Uber, and they kind of they move, like, like that's where it's exciting, that's where like when you're out of college, like that's the thing that you want to work on. And like I want blockchain to be the thing that the smartest people really want to work on, and so that we get these people who can develop these great, these great ideas and the crypto winter is kind of making that a little harder. Like during the boom, yeah, it seemed much more like the next big thing. And so now I kind of feel like I have to, I have to make a stronger argument. People are less predisposed. And I, I want to ask you a little bit more about that. But first, I had one job when I came out here and I didn't do it, which was to tell you all that you can submit questions on Slido.com mm. for the end of this. This was literally the only thing they asked me to do. Use the <laughs> hashtag S. XSW, which is South by Southwest. Um, and I think you can vote questions up or down. We have some here because some of you already know that. So thank you for reminding me. Um, so that, I just wanted to drill down on that one thing. Do, have you noticed that there were more people coming in and more people interested in doing projects when the prices of all the crypto assets were rising than you're seeing now? 
I, I, I think more. I think more than we were seeing a couple of months ago. I think there has been a resurgence, which I think is really good. I'm not sure what's responsible for that, but I think there has been sort of a return to this idea that people are interested in moving into the space. I think um, more mature projects is probably a significant part of that. <coughs> Anyone who's worked at like a small company, you know that when you're a small company with a new idea, it's kind of hard to attract people who can like grow something to scale, and you kind of have to get to that sort of Slight, slightly past the startup stage before you can attract the type of talented people who can really just, you know, really bring you to scale and, and bring high level product market fit. And, 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 and we're starting to see more people who are attracted to the growth in the space. So even though the prices have gone down, the space has grown, the projects are bigger, the budgets are maybe not as big as the ICOs were, but the projects are more mature. There are companies that are focusing on product market fit. I'd like to say Ripple's one of them. Um, so I think we are, we are getting more and more talented people in space. And I guess that's the other thing that I need to say is like, we're, we're, not, we're not dying or in trouble. Like, don't think that because the prices are low, there are, if, I could, if I could get one message through, it would be don't think that because the prices are low, that means that there, there aren't still fascinating projects, there isn't new technology. We're developing fundamental new crypto primitives with zero knowledge proofs. We don't even know what that's gonna make possible. I mean, it's, it's a super exciting space and, and that, that has not changed. Can you tell me about the work that Ripple is doing with universities? Ubri, is that how you mm -hmm. say it? Yes. So there are a couple of technolo technological areas that everybody in blockchain needs. So like one example is quantum computing. Quantum computing is coming, we just don't know exactly when. The current algorithms that blockchains use will become vulnerable if quantum computing reaches certain stages. Um, and there, we have quantum resistant algorithms today, but they're, they're terrible for blockchain applications. If we had to use them, we would, but that would be kind of really disappointing to have to do that. So we would like to have uh, algorithms that are quantum resistant that meet the requirements that, of blockchain. Like we need really compact proofs. We need really, we, we can't be very CPU intensive to verify. There's some very specific things that we need. And that's a hard thing to do because there's no linear path to it. It's like we need a new algorithm. Where do you start? Like what area of, of of cryptography should that new algorithm come out of or should it be completely new and we have no idea. Um, there's work going on on consensus algorithms. You probably know proof of work and proof of stake are sort of competing with different forms of federated Byzantine agreement. There's fundamental new work going on on building better algorithms to solve the double spend problem. Zero knowledge proofs, there's been a tremendous explosion. So to, everybody in this space needs research. And, and I was saying before that like the market seems to suggest that everybody thinks this space is either gonna succeed or fail. We want this space to succeed, and that means we need research. So the way Ubri works is we give colleges money to do blockchain-related research, and we don't tell them what research they have to do. They generally will listen to our ideas, because I hope they're good ones, and also if someone's giving you money, you generally listen to what they want you to do. Um, but we don't condition it on them doing the research that we want, but we tell them what we think the space needs. Sometimes we tell them what we need. And it's a way to make sure that like, we get really smart people in college working on blockchain stuff, and if that means they produce good research, that's great. If that means they sort of go into the blockchain space, that's great. And I think something interesting is, to, to, like I give the examples in crypto because that's my background, but there's also things in economics and in, in governance and in regulation, and this touches so many different areas, even like things, things in, 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 the way, in human societies and the nature of money, and it just, just touches everything. Computer science is, and cryptography are like the most obvious. And we're finding that, 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 that Ubri kind of brings people into the fold from all of these different areas of research and focuses them on the research that, that we need to have if we're, gonna, if we're gonna grow this space and if we're gonna have people who you know, work in that space. And if people are coming up through college or even if they're already working but they're interested in working in the blockchain space, what recommendations do you have for them? Well, apply at Ripple, obviously. I mean, <laughs> I, I, will, I, I will say that um, because we're developing new technologies and because product market fit is so challenging and because there's so many bad ideas in this space, like having people who are really good at, at almost everything, I mean, obviously like I focus a lot on the technology area, but, but legal and regulatory compliance and, and economics and just, and even governance, like governance is a complicated thing. If you have a system where there's no coercion, everybody can just run whatever code they want, but people have to agree or they won't be able to operate. How do you run that? Like, do you, do you create a foundation? Like, what do you do? Um, it's a tr fantastically exciting space. There's a lot of companies that are, that are hiring across the board for, j for just about everything. Um, and of course, Ripple's, Ripple's always hiring, so I, I, I gotta get that plug in. Um, it really is a sort of talent limited space. A, a lot of what we can do is limited by getting people who can, who can run and manage those projects, people who can write code, people who can 
even legal people who can approve contracts and just, just every, every, the, whole, the whole corporate structure is just, we're in, a new, we're in a space that's very challenging. And to some extent, sometimes we're not exact, the regulatory compliance can be very complicated. Um, we're dealing with companies that are very conservative, particularly on Ripple, where we sell a lot of software to banks and financial institutions. They're very conservative. Like, they have to have high assurance that they're dealing with, you know, they're dealing with people who are going to be there. It's, it, it's super exciting. If you're the kind of person who really wants to work on something that's exciting and where you're not following a roadmap and you're kind of trying to figure out what the business is going to be, like, that, that's where we are. I, I love it. And what's the last hurdle that Ripple has accomplished, and then what's the next one that you're trying to overcome? Boy, that's, that's actually a pretty tough question. Um, I think one of, the, one of the biggest things is we kind of had this evolution where we wanted to be able to sell software to banks, and then we wanted to be able to um, bring traffic onto our payment network, and then we want to settle with a digital asset, and we kind of also have these aspirations of gr like growing the whole cryptocurrency space through efforts like Uber and Spring. And, and we're trying to pull a whole lot of threads together. And I think the biggest challenge for us is sort of keeping that fitting into a coherent system. One of the analogies I sometimes use is imagine if you work for Twitter in 1990. Obviously, Twitter didn't exist in 1990. You'd be like, oh my god, people need better phones. And people would think you were crazy, right? You'd be like, wait, what? What do phones have to do with what you do? Like, what we're, we're trying to envision what people are going to need and, and build those technologies and encourage them um, to kind of grow the, the spaces fit. And I think we struggle also with product market fit. Like, we know international payments are, are, are a good product market fit. We, we're, we're doing that. That's going to continue to do the major thing that we've done. And I think probably our biggest success is getting that alignment. And I think our biggest challenge is figuring out how we can also sort of grow the areas where it's not quite so clear what the product market Where people come to us and say, I have this great idea and I want to build it out, but I don't know what people are going to use it for. And then we have to say, that's a really good idea, like, go build it, but we also don't know what people are going to use it, you, you use it for. You know, like, uh, there might have been a time when people say, why would someone want a phone connected to the internet? And today, people are like, why would someone want a blockchain phone? And I don't have an, I don't have an answer to that yet. You know? there might, there might, it might be that there is no answer, right? It might be that, that that's a terrible idea. And an internet phone, you probably remember, um, was, it, was, it someone, was it someone at Microsoft? I think it was one of the top executives at Microsoft like laughing at the iPhone, like, who wants a phone shaped like a slice of bread? I bet three quarters of the people in this room at least have a phone like shaped like a slice of bread, right? Like mine is shaped, shaped, shaped like a piece of toast, right? Um, this is the format that, that won the war. And, and there was a time when that seemed ridiculous. And so a blockchain phone seems pretty ridiculous now. Um, and it, I'm not saying it's not, by the way. That does seem kind of ridiculous to me. But, but I'm, I'm very humble to understand that it's, the future is notoriously hard to predict, and I don't have a crystal ball. So we have to work on technologies that are interesting, whether or not we see the use case. And obviously, like, I have the luxury of working at a company that's very focused on a use case that we think we understand, but that can't be all that we do. Like, that, can't be the, that can't be the end of it. Like, we, we have to, because you can't have, like, it's just like you couldn't have just Twitter and nobody else on the internet. Like, Twitter could not succeed as the only internet application, because nobody would carry phones, and Twitter wouldn't have a market to sell into, right? It's the fact that there's this whole ecosystem that gives Twitter a market to sell into. That's the reason I carry a phone and can access Twitter whenever I want to. Um, there, there has to be an ecosystem in order for you to sell into it. So we have that challenge of figuring out how can we make sure there's a healthy ecosystem when we can't predict the future. And so we're kind of feeling around blind, trying to, trying to get people working on interesting things when we don't know what the use case fit's going to be. And where is Ripple right now in its mission to s simplify, I guess, international payments? How many banks are, are you guys working with, and how many transactions are happening? We have about 200 financial institutions that have, that have signed with us, and we're, we built RippleNet to connect them together and, and manage their pay, and sort of exchange their payment information. The crux of RippleNet is because, if you imagine the way old or traditional payment networks work, they're kind of push. So I want to make a payment to someone, and we just sort of push money out, and it takes more hops and gets to them. The crux of what we did with RippleNet is it closes that loop, so you know the whole path that it's going to take immediate, from the beginning. Um, which is nice for a payment network because you know what the fees are. I don't know if any of you have made international payments where they tell you they can't tell you how much it's going to cost you or they can't tell you how much money you're going to deliver because they don't know the path. They don't know what the fees are going to be. Uh, they want to charge you money to lock in an exchange rate, but they can't. Like, it's just like this solves all of that messaging problem, which makes it possible to settle with the payment. 
The thing that we're working on now with, pro with technologies like XRapid is to actually settle with the payment. Like we built the enabling technology to allow that to happen, and now we're kind of trying to, trying to get to the point where they actually settle the payment with the payment. Um, how many of you know the difference between payment and settlement? Not too many? So I'll, oh, a couple. All right, so let me just, just give you just a high level on this. I go to a, a restaurant and I pay with my Visa card and they let me go and they don't call the police saying that I left without paying for my food. That's a payment. But I still have to pay my credit card bill and somebody still has to wire money to the restaurant, right, or ACH or whatever payment system they use. It has, the payment has not been settled. Traditionally, payment and settlement have been completely bifurcated into completely separate systems. SWIFT is a payment system that doesn't do anything with settlement. And the problem with that is it makes it hard to do a good payment because like, you don't know if the recipient, you, you can't check the validity of the recipient, you don't know necessarily what the fees are gonna be, what the exchange rate's gonna be when the payment settles. So we built a system that, and the only reason they've been separated in institutional payments is historic. These systems date back from the old days when people had giant wheels of magnetic tape and the tape was like on the bank's transaction computer during the day and someone would physically carry it over to the settlement computer that talked to the other banks at night. And there was no way to settle during the day because the tape had to be on the computer that was handling the bank's transactions. It had to go to the settlement computer when it was done. Um, I'm not joking, I'm serious. If, you, if you, you look at your glitzy like front end application for your bank and it's all really cool and you can access it on your phone and it's all really, you know, it's, it's 21st century, but you scratch just a couple of layers below the surface and it's like you took a time machine. If you're lucky, you're in the, the mid, seven, mid to late 70s. Like that's when these systems that plumb the movement of money were built and they are breaking down. Make, make no, even if blockchain completely fails, even if all cryptocurrencies are a bust, the payment world is gonna change because it's just, it's, it's terrible. If, if you look at new corporates, they have hundreds of payment employees. Facebook has hundreds of, of, of payment employees. Um, they don't want them. If any payment company or bank would love to be able to go up to a company like Uber or Amazon and say, fire all your payment people and we'll just do all your payments for you. Who wouldn't want, be, who wouldn't want that business? But they, the infrastructure to do that does not exist. It's being built. It's going to happen. No ma it, it just, it's going to happen no matter what. And how is Ripple going to decide how much it costs? Um, well, that's, um, that's it, it's interesting that we're really not in the payment flow very much. So we haven't, we built these decentralized systems where we're not in the payment flow. So in a payment on RippleNet, it's between the two endpoints. We might, as part of the agreement, they might pay some, per, some small per transaction fee, or obviously like we could have some negotiated price. But generally, we're outside of the payment flows with XRapid. Um, it's a flow of XRP between exchanges, so we're outside of those payment flows. We're not really looking, at least now, to monetize the payment flows. We're more looking to grow the space because we, because like as part of our thesis that like we need a robust ecosystem, we need to prove product market fit. Um, it's certainly possible that in the future, like those could be things that are, are revenue sources for us. Is, is there a place in the system that Ripple plans to make money? Um, well, certainly, <laughs> I mean, yeah, obviously the thesis of the company is, um, so there's a couple of different things. So one of them is just like, if, if, if you look at a company, Amazon's a good example, like they were a bookstore and they moved into adjacent verticals. Like if we're selling books, we'll sell all this stuff. But they also watched the cloud computing revolution and they're like, we're a bunch of smart people. We have a bunch of money. Cloud computing is going to happen. We should probably like try it. And they also tried some things that didn't work. But if look at Apple. Apple was a computer company. They signed an agreement with Apple Music that says, we get computers, you get music. They never envisioned themselves as a music company. But, but, but the iPod's not a Sony product, right? It's an Apple product. Why is that? Because Apple saw a revolution in digital music and they embraced it. Um, and I think you can come up with all kinds of examples. Google, the same thing, very strategic. So I think we're going to watch a payment revolution happen. And I think we're going to look for the places where there is potential revenue in there. But I mean, obviously, right now, the vast majority of our company is laser focused on international payments because the product market fit is so clear. The demand is there. We've built all the tech to do it. So I think that's like that's the slam dunk, I, I hope. We'll see, see if history proves me right on that. But then I think there's, there's that strategy of like you're watching a revolution happen and you're well positioned to figure out where the money is. The only thing you have to watch out for is like finding the wrong places. Like you could imagine Google saying people pay for software like the money's in the browsers. We should make a browser and sell it and that's how we'll make our money. And obviously that would have been the wrong place. They make a browser now and give it away because people have to have good browsers. The money is in the data and the money is in the advertising. So we need to be careful to figure out. We can't build the whole ecosystem ourselves and we don't want to give the sort of lucrative pieces. It's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting sort of business challenge. And Swift, it seems, has responded to what Ripple is doing. How does their new technology, the response that they've created, compare to what Ripple's doing? 
Um, so they, they changed the, they sort of pressed on their customers to credit payments more quickly, and they added an acknowledgement at the end of the payment. So it used to be fire and forget, and now they send a message back from the end when the payment's acknowledged. And that does address some of the pain points that people had. But I think, um, like, like one of the, one thing, there are a couple things it doesn't address. So one of them is it doesn't enable settlement at the time of payment. So if you think that that's an important thing, it kind of attacks our sort of sub submarine strategy of like, we'll give you a better payment system, and it can settle at the time of payment, but even if you don't care about that, it's still a better payment system. So it, I, I mean, obviously the bi-directional messaging and, the, and, and everything, it's still a better payment system, but like if you can take away the major pain points, maybe that sort of attacks our strategy of saying we're going to take away your major pain points, so we'll be like, well, we can take away some of those pain points too. But it doesn't fix the fundamental problem. It's kind of, it's, it's kind of like, you know, like if a music company tried to combat the iPod by like dropping the price of CDs or making them hold more data or something. Like the fundamental problem is the settlement. And I think when we talk to our customers, banks and financial institutions, banks in particular, it, they're getting squeezed by their correspondents. That's a very expensive relationship for them to maintain. They're losing business to non-bank payment companies. And banks have discovered, they used to think to some extent, like, we don't care about payments. That's not how we make our money. We make our money because we hold people's money and we make loans, and that's how we make all our money. But if I'm not using a bank for my payments, why would I keep my money there? Like, I want to keep my money where I can make my payments, and then why would I go to the bank with a lo for a loan if I don't have a relationship with them, like, and they're facing loan competition from these online loan companies? Like, banks are realizing that there's disruption happening, and they're looking for some fundamental way to do things better, and uh, we're, we're offering that to them, and SWIFT really isn't. And I think also recently we focused a lot on non-bank financial institutions, and they have interesting challenges too. Um, so challenges that they have is sometimes it's difficult for them to find banking partners, and sometimes they're competing with banks for payment business, but they need the banks to move money, and so they have these other challenges. And the ability for them to interact directly with each other through RippleNet without having to go through banks as intermediaries or without having to go through SWIFT um, is tremendously interesting to them too. So I, 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 I think we... We have to be responsive to what our customers want, and I think Swift is realizing now that they're going to have to be responsive too, so game on, I guess. And I want to get to some of these questions, because I, I can't tell how many there are, but there's lots of voting, so I'm guessing there's a lot. Um, let's see. Oh, this one has been voted up a lot. It's new. Do you see real-world payments as a use case, for example, buying tacos and beer at South by with crypto? Um, that was the first use case that I think, if you look at the Bitcoin white paper, Satoshi's very first blockchain, he said peer-to-peer -peer digital cash, which seems to be focused on that sort of real-world retail payments. Um, and my answer is eventually yes, but maybe never directly on a blockchain because of those scalability issues, maybe through layer two scaling systems like, like Lightning or layer three scaling like Interledger. I think that's the obvious use case, but, but I'll tell you why I think that the, it's the wrong way to look at crypto to say like, is it ready for that? If you look at, let's say the growth of the internet, or even if you look at the growth of physical goods transport, like it's like physical goods transport. So it was shipping containers and it was um, it was trucks. These are not retail delivery things, right? And if you look at the internet, it was the military, it was universities, and then it was big information providers. Like these are not really retail information cases. I think we have to have a mature ecosystem before we can target those retail systems. I'm not a big believer in the bottom up strategy. I know this. This separates me from many, many other people in the space. And I don't think they're wrong to try it. I wish them all the luck in the world. If they're successful, that's great. But I think like, if you look at the history of, of the way similar technologies have developed, that bottom-up strategy is going to be limited to a small number of enthusiasts. Like, Look at the internet. The internet was limited to a small number of enthusiasts who were willing to edit DOS batch files and use non-graphical tools until it reached a certain point where there were major information service providers. American Airlines had a website, you know, and they had graphical tools, and like it was mature. But it's but no one's going to build a mature ecosystem for nothing in the expectation that at some future point it'll be ready for retail adoption. Like you need a path to get there, and we're on that path. We're just earlier on it than I think most people think. And I think I should mention that question was from Danny at Elmatic Wallet. I think I'm supposed to do that. I'm not sure. Um, the next question: How do you foresee the use of blockchain for identity management? And this is from Geo. I love it from a technological standpoint. I think it makes sense that, like, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who have these great technologies for handling identity on the blockchain. And the basic idea is um, I need to prove my identity to a whole bunch of companies. So some identity provider verifies my identity. 
Um, and then I'm in control, like they give me some sort of an identifying marker, like they say you're customer 406231 and I can prove I'm customer 406231 and then I can provide, or maybe they give me multiple identities and so I go to one company that I want to do business with, let's say a bank, and I prove that I have a particular identity with that identity company. Maybe I only use that particular number that one time. Now they don't know who I am, but they know they can go to the identity company if there's a subpoena or whatever the, whatever the rules are. Like if the rules of that, I'll pick an identity company whose rules I like. So if they say like, we'll only give away the information if ordered to by a court in the United States. I'll be like, sweet, that's cool with me, and I, I go to them. And then banks might or might not be willing to accept that identity company. And the, what you use the blockchain for is you use the blockchain to sort of handle the sort of transition of my identity from state to state. So it's only when my identity changes state in some ways that I go to the blockchain. And blockchains are good at, if you think about Bitcoin, like a Bitcoin payment is a change of state in the Bitcoin system. Like Bitcoins are really, uh, blockchains are really good at sort of arbitrating changes of state. And those changes of state would not be that frequent. The problem that I have is there is no precedent for an identity system that wasn't either mandated by law or run by a government as sort of, as sort of being successful. So, and if we have 50 identity projects that are all completely different and incompatible, so someone needs to sort of lead the charge. Um, there are a couple of companies this is one of the other problems, is like there's a lot of good people working on you know, good projects in that same space. I'd rather there be one great one, kind of, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it's one of those things, it's like retail adoption. Um, it would be great, I can see a sort of product market fit, but we're not there yet, and I, I don't know exactly how we're gonna get there. But it's an exciting area to work on. Um, can you explain the origin of XRP and Ripple and why there's conflicting information and controversy with respect to security law? And this is from Mike. So I guess I'll do it in the order asked, although the reverse order might be a little... Uh, so the origin of XRP and Ripple, XRP originated when Arthur Brito, um, myself, uh, Jed McCaleb, and Chris Larson built the original XRP ledger back in 2011 and 2012. Um, the, original, the original founders who built that system gifted a bunch of XRP to Ripple to have the company sort of work and build an ecosystem around it. Um, so Ripple is a company, it's a traditional company, it has stockholders, it has headquarters in San Francisco, it has employees. XRP is an asset on a digital ledger. The XRP ledger is not owned or controlled by Ripple, it's its, it's, its own thing whose stakeholders are exchanges, Ripple, people who use it, Coil, and. It's hard to know, it's just like who are the stakeholders in Bitcoin, right, like are the holders? It's very hard to know who the stakeholders are, who brings value to the system. Uh, so why is there conflicting information and controversy around it with respect to security law? Because security law has not changed in, you know, with respect to blockchain technology in a long time. In the early days of blockchain, there were people who were arguing that Bitcoin's XRP and everything else were inherently counterfeit, and citing the Von Nothaus case, and they had some good arguments. It wasn't clear. Um, we've gotten guidance from some organizations. The SEC recently has talked about how they're going to think about, like, what deciding how these tokens meet security law. Um, but they have not given a black and white test. They haven't said, this is the test. Like, they've, 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 they've given a test, but it's, it's filled with vague terms. The Howey test, you know, came from a series of, of um, court cases that were decided, um, and it's just really hard to figure out how that applies. We're pretty comfortable that XRP is not a security, but ultimately it's going to be the SEC and perhaps the courts that make that decision. I would say the biggest drag on cryptocurrency projects today is regulatory uncertainty, by which I mean not laws that are bad. Laws that are bad are a problem too, like laws that, like, okay, I get it, but that really should be changed because it doesn't make sense. It's not that. It's laws that we don't know what the laws are because they use terms that it's, like for example, in the money transmitter law, it talks about someone who accepts a payment. Well, what does it mean to accept a payment you know, on, on, on a blockchain system? What does it mean? Like, it's, it's not really clear. Like, for example, if, if, if you have payment channels, I don't know if many of you know what payment channels are, but they sort of have balances. Like, if you just adjust the balance on a payment channel, is that accepting a payment? Is the payment done? It's like, it's, we don't, it's very hard to decide how the laws um, apply. And that's why I think you'll see many organizations, Ripple and many others, uh, Coin Center is another, lobbying regulators not so much to change the law, but to clarify it, like to tell us what it is that we need to do so that someone doesn't come down two years later and say, hey, what you were doing completely in the open and completely transparently for the last four years was illegal from day one and you should have known that. And we're like, we meet with you like every week about what we're doing and now you're telling us we should have realized four years ago that it was fundamentally completely illegal? Like that doesn't make any sense. And so. 
it, it is, I have tremendous respect for the people who do that type of regulatory engagement. And I will say that there are a lot of forward thinking regulators who understand that, like, imagine if in the early days of the internet, the United States had said, hey, this internet thing is being used to radicalize terrorists and violate copyright. Like, we don't want any internet in the United States. There still would have been an Apple and a Google and a Microsoft and all those companies. They just probably wouldn't have been American companies. We would have faced a take it or leave it choice with an internet that might or might not look like the internet we have today. And we would have had no, I mean, that would have been obviously a terrible choice. And I, there are some regulators who understand that they have that same position with blockchain now. The United States, if the United States set out regulatory clarity, I think a lot of countries would probably follow what the United States does. And right now they're sort of being forced to walk out ahead of the bunch. Thailand's a good example of a country that kind of, um, and there are many others that kind of like started to set down regulatory rules. Luxembourg is another. And they're like, we don't want to be in conflict with the rest of the world. We don't want to have laws that are fundamentally different. So people do what they need to do to comply with our laws. And then they discover they can't comply with other countries. But there just isn't, there just isn't that kind of thing really happening yet. And I think we need, we need that to happen. We need to get rid of that uncertainty. I'd rather have a bad law than a law where I can't tell whether I'm breaking it or not. Seems fair. How do you see blockchain being used in non-traditional industries like agriculture? The example given is avocado farms for Matt. Yeah, I don't know. I'll be, I, I have no idea. I, I see all of these um, applications, these sort of small retail applications. Um, payments are a slam dunk. Things that are closely affiliated with payments like trade finance and lending, make uh, the further away you go from payments, the harder it is to see it. Um, so I. I honestly don't know. I, I don't want to discourage anyone from working on these things because I, I don't know how the product market fix is going to come out, but, but I don't know. And what are the, some of the common pushbacks that you get from major banks that decide not to adopt Ripple for settlements and payments? Um, I think one is that they, they, don't, they don't see the advantages because they're not positioned so that they see them. Like you have to have some specific, so in the early days when you have no banks and you're selling to banks, you just sell to any bank. Like you just need a, you have, you have to have a bank, right? Like if, you, if you're like, we sell software to banks. Okay, who have you sold to? Well, none, none yet. Right? And when you have one bank, if your proposition is we're a network, a payment network that sells to banks and you only have one bank, you need two banks, right? Like you just need another bank. Um, and so in the early days, we were just like trying to get banks on board. Like, I'll be honest, we were just trying to get banks on board. We didn't care whether they saw that much of a value proposition. But now we want a network that adds value. Like, we want a network that has lots of payments flowing through it. And so now we're trying to look for really good product market fit. For like, how can you get the benefits from what Ripple is doing? Um, will it help you attract new customers? Will it help you offer a product that you weren't able to offer? Does it help you cut costs in some specific thing that you're doing? And I think the biggest pushback is where we can't find that fit. Um, and, 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 there, and, and like if we had 30% of the world's banks, then there'd probably be a fit for almost everyone. But like there has to be, there has to be somebody else on the network who they want to do business with. And there has to be, they, or they have to have something that they're offering. Um, and some banks just aren't in that position. Small, smaller, um, very, very large banks and sort of very, very small banks. So if they're not in that sweet spot and there isn't that product market fit, it doesn't do us any good if the bank is just trying to save some tiny amount of money or cut, you know, or, or they're not getting any, or they just want a press release. And then we go all the way through and they hit some sort of a hiccup. Like let's say they need to do more development because there's an incompatibility between their systems and our software. They're not going to be motivated to drive that through. And so we've started to focus a lot on if we want to get the right things out of the pipeline, we have to make sure we put the right things into the pipeline. And so uh, where there isn't that fit, we're being very, very picky about making sure that that fit is good. And, and, and we want our customers to do the same thing. And how can we rely on a system being truly democratized when the banks, private entities, are controlling the rules of the decentralized database? So, that, so they, they don't. They don't. Um, just like Bitcoin on the XRP, well, there's the XRP ledger and there's RippleNet, like the system that the banks are using. But in both, in, in, in the XRP ledger case, it's easier to, it's easier to clarify what's going on there. Um, the decentralized database, the rules are being followed by every single participant who runs that software. So if you download the software that runs the XRP ledger and you run it, just like if you run the Bitcoin software, you're enforcing every single rule. You won't allow um, anything that, that violates the rules. And that's because of something fundamental about Bitcoin and fundamental about pretty much all blockchains, which is if I log into my bank and they tell me I have $30,000 in my account today and they tell me I have $28,000 tomorrow, I can ask them why they report $28,000, but I would have to ask them and I would have to look at their explanation. In every blockchain, the only way to say you had $30,000 yesterday and you had $28,000 today is to present a sort of a, a signed transaction, present the authorization 
for that change. And the XRP ledger is built on that, on that design. So the rules are enforced by everybody who runs the software. Um, unless you think the banks are the major stakeholders in the XRP ledger, which if you did, that would be great. Like if you really thought banks were fundamentally bought into XRP, I think that would be a good thing. Um, they're, they're really not. The XRP ledger stakeholders tend to be exchanges, companies like Coil, um, companies like Ripple, wall companies that make wallets and other cryptocurrency companies. Like the XRP ledger is very much a creature of the cryptocurrency space. It's very much not a banking thing today. I think you could argue Ripple would like it to be more like a banking thing, but, but it, it isn't. Banks are not fundamental, uh, not broadly fundamentally bought. And if you think they are, again, that's great. Like, if you think that we're bringing banks into the crypto space in mass, I, uh, that's wonderful. They're not completely bought in because there's issues with making sure that the liquidity is there, making sure the reliability is there. That system is run by its stakeholders, whoever they are, just like the Bitcoin blockchain is. Like, if, 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 if a bank or Ripple wants to change some rule in the XRP ledger, let's say we want to make more XRP, you would have to run that software or your server will never see any more XRP. And that means Coinbase would have to run that server. Poloniex would have to run that software. And Ripple has no ability, nor does any bank have any ability to tell Coinbase or Poloniex what software to run. Um, it's hard to know what the governance actually is. Just like, what does it take to change the Bitcoin block size until someone tried? We didn't really know what it took. Um, so it's hard to know who the real stakeholders are and what will happen with push from, if push were to come to shove. But I don't see banks being able to tell like Coinbase and Poloniex and wallet providers and cryptocurrency enthusiasts to run particular code on their, soft, on their systems and having that work. I think it's worth digging into this a little bit because the, uh, if, is there the difference between the XRP ledger stakeholders and who's on RippleNet? So if there's banks on RippleNet that don't necessarily they're not necessarily stakeholders in XRP Ledger, and, right. and who is, and what is the incentives for more people to be on the XRP Ledger? So the interesting thing is banks don't really want to be those stakeholders um, because they don't want to use a system that's run by their competitors. So they, they, if they're going to be using a cryptocurrency, it's because it's juris, sort of jurisdictionally neutral. It's because their competitors don't control their access to it. And it's not like all the banks in the world are going to get together and run a cryptocurrency system, at least. Um, I don't see that, I, I mean, I, I don't foresee that happening. It's too different from the type of business that they have. Um, I think the stakeholders today, certainly Ripple's a stakeholder today, other companies like uh, Coil and Strata, um, exchange, um, exchanges, um, exchanges seem to be the biggest stakeholders today, but what's weird is like exchanges have a lot of power. If you, if you saw the Bitcoin, Bitcoin cash, but like when exchanges said that they would support, you know, both sides of the fork or will only support this side, like that had a tremendous, uh, a tremendous um, effect on the way the fork went. One of the things with decentralized systems is it's very hard to know who their stakeholders are. Theoretically, they're the people who are bringing the value because if they don't go along with a rule change, then the, then the value, of, like if you, when Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash split, the price kind of split too. And you could see like how much of the value went in each direction. Um, and so it's hard to know where that value is coming from. So it's hard to know who those stakeholders are. Um, but I would say it's, a, it's the XRP ecosystem, which today is mostly exchanges. But again, they don't wield their power. Like exchanges usually won't say like, we really like this change or we really oppose this change. They feel like they're more neutral. So it's, it's very hard to know. And XRP is different than Bitcoin where they're incentivized by Bitcoin, by being rewarded with Bitcoin to be on the ledger. So how does XRP keep the right people invested in there are, there, there are no incentives, right, there is not an incentive. And this is something that I think Bitcoin got wrong and we'll see if history proves me right on this. There's a huge problem with using, using incentives that way and you don't need to. So I'll start with the problem and then why you don't need to. So the problem is if you're a miner and I'm a miner and I'm mining, I'm making more money mining or I'm mining more cheaply than you, I'll drive you out of business because I'll mine more and you'll mine less. So it's a race to the bottom. So that means if I can do something malicious that makes me money, you almost have to do it. Um, and you can't be a super reliable, you can't be super reliable, you can't have high quality anything because like those are costs that you can't make back. It's a complete race to the bottom. And, and I think we're seeing the other problem is that the people who have cheap power and good ASICs look a lot like each other, right? Like they tend to be in the same parts of the world. So it doesn't actually decentralize the operation of the system. And the reason you don't need incentives is if you get rid of proof of work, it doesn't cost anything. Like the reason mining is expensive is because it's made expensive. If you keep it cheap, then you don't need incentives. Um, anyone will do it. And the way we've designed the system is like, if you're doing a good job of doing the equivalent of mining, then you'll remain selected as a validator. And if you do a bad job, then you're not, then people will just stop listening to you. So like the good ones accumulate and the bad ones get excluded. And the critical difference is, so first of all, 
I have no reason to not want you to validate. It's not like we're fighting over anything. Like, if you're better than me, then I'll just stop doing it. Hey, it's just a cost for me. But the cost is comparable to running a name server or a mail server. It's very cheap because it's, it's not proof of work based. So um, I think that's kind of the, the lack of incentive is actually like the only reason that you would do it is to help the network. And I think one other thing is you have to limit the damage that a validator can do. Miners can double spend. Validators, no matter how many validators or how they conspire, they can't double spend. So the crux, that, that crux issue is, uh, is avoided. Um, what, will we ever see truly stable cryptocurrencies that are not centrally controlled? Maybe. Um, if, if any of you are familiar with DAI, which is a crypto collateralized stable coin, if those projects are successful, those are, not, those are centrally controlled in that someone has to provide a price feed, but that's about it. It's just a price feed. And so what that is, is that's something that's like worth a dollar because it's a claim on a pool of Ethereum. And the price of Ethereum can change, and your claim changes with it. So um, we could see those types of stable coin projects. Um, and we could see cryptocurrencies themselves become more stable as they get real world adoption. Real world use cases, I think, will lead to stability. And then that's the next question is, what will it take for mass blockchain adoption? A more mature ecosystem, uh, all across, whether it's wallet providers, whether it's exchanges, like the whole ecosystem has to become more mature, just like the internet had to become more mature you know, before it was ready for mass adoption. It has to be reliable, has to do what people want it to do. Oh, we have 14 seconds left. I think that's it then. I don't think any of your answers have been shorter than that. No, I can't imagine. Yes. That. I'm not known for brevity. Uh, okay, well, thank you guys so much. David, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure.